Welcome, and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Leslie Babinski, and I'm the director of the Center for Child and Family Policy at Duke University. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Salzburger Distinguished Lecture featuring Raj Chetty. The Center for Child and Family Policy sponsors the Salzburger Distinguished Lecture Series to enhance the intellectual community, not only for our faculty, research scientists, and staff, but the Duke University community more broadly, the Durham and Triangle region, and now that we're virtual, folks from across the United States. The lecture series features experts who've demonstrated excellence in behavioral science and theory, as well as science to policy applications. These lectures are made possible through an endowment from the Arthur Sulzberger family. And I'd like to take a moment now to recognize and to thank Cindy Sulzberger and her husband, Stephen Green, who are joining us tonight. It's our thank pleasure. You. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. We're so appreciative of your support for this great lecture series, and we're certainly looking forward to your participation tonight. I'm pleased to say that tonight's lecture is also sponsored by the Duke Population Research Institute, or Dupree. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Marcus Rungel, an associate professor in the Sanford School of Public Policy, a faculty affiliate of the Center for Child and Family Policy, and Dupree, and Marcos will introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Leslie, uh, and thanks for assigning an economist to introduce another economist. That's uh, that's nice uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, adjustments there. Uh, uh, but let, before I introduce uh, Dr. Cherry, uh, let me talk a little bit about a couple of minutes to, to here to, to tell you about uh, Dupree a little bit and uh, talking about our institute as really the center in which scholars are challenging the boundaries of interdisciplinary population research. Uh, and we are advancing uh, uh, knowledge and training uh, uh, researchers as, as we go. Uh, this is a center that is funded uh, by federal funds from NIH uh, and also with provost uh, funds. Uh, so please visit our website and, 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 and learn a little bit about what we do in the center. It's a great pleasure to collaborate with, with the child, uh, Center for Child and Family Policy on this uh, lecture today. Uh, then I have to talk about a few uh, uh, words, words about logistics. Uh, and uh, Dr. Chetty will be speaking for about 45 minutes. And then when we'll switch to a, a Q&A session uh, uh, that my colleague, uh, Professor Anna Gasman Pines, will be leading. Uh, you should be submitting your questions as we go to the Q, uh, using the Q&A functions on, on your screen. Uh, and you should be doing those at any time as they, uh, as they come to your mind and they're gonna be addressed in the end. So uh, thank you for that. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Raj Shetty, uh, who is the William A. Ackman Professor of Economics at Harvard University. Um, there, he's the director of the Opportunities Insight. We're gonna, uh, gonna be uh, hearing a bit more about Opportunities Insights, uh, and, uh, which is a center that is using big data to understand uh, how we can give children from disadvantaged backgrounds better chances of succeeding in life. So very closely related to everything we care about in the center. Uh, his research utilizes Economic theory to draw solid empirical evidence and help design more effective government, uh, which is a central that his work. His work is covers topics from tax policy, unemployment insurance to education, affordable housing, and has been widely cited, of course, in academia, uh, in media outlets, and congressional testimony. Uh, Dr. Chetty received his PhD from Harvard. Uh, and is one of the youngest uh, tenure professors in that institution's history. Uh, he, he's taught previously at UC Berkeley and Stanford as well. So all the great places. Uh, so Dr. Chetty has received numerous awards during his career uh, for his research, including a MacArthur Genius Fellowship and a John Bates Clark Medal uh, that is given to economists under the age of 40, uh, whose work is judged to have made the most significant contribution to the field. And by the way, we believe is a clear indicator of who is gonna get the Nobel Prize in the future. So it's, uh, uh, we, are, we are waiting on that for, for Dr. Shetty for sure. Uh, in 2018, he was elected to, as a member of the National Academy of Sciences. In 2020, he was awarded the Infosys uh, Prize in Economics 
uh, for his pioneering research on identifying the barriers to economic opportunity and for developing solutions to help people escape from poverty towards better life outcomes. Let me just wrap this up to mention that uh, a few weeks ago, NPR uh, has covered some of his research on the Planet Money uh, uh, a newsletter that they have. Uh, and Dr. Chetty was described as the Beyonce of economics, uh, uh, which is apparently a very good uh, 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 association there. Uh, I'll let Dr. Chetty explain that a little bit more, uh, but I definitely uh, can see that uh, his attempt to make research accessible uh, to, to, the, uh, to all of us uh, inside and outside academia and to reach policymakers is, is what makes this really a, 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 pop, a pop star at the end of the day. Dr. Chetty, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Marcos, for the warm introduction. Uh, it's really a privilege and an honor to have a chance to speak with all of you tonight. I, I can't promise to be as entertaining as Beyonce would be, but I will uh, do my best in the economics context. So I'm going to share my screen here uh, and share some slides. Um, so hopefully you're seeing a set of slides here on the screen. And so uh, let me dive in. So what I'd like to talk with you uh, about tonight is how we can improve economic opportunity for disadvantaged youth across America by taking action in our own communities, in our own neighborhoods, colleges, and so forth. But I want to start at a much more macro, big picture level by talking about the American dream uh, at a national level. So what is the American dream? It's, of course, a multifaceted concept that means different things to different people. I want to talk about one way that the American dream has traditionally been conceptualized, which is the idea that this is a country where through hard work, any child should have the chance of moving up in the income distribution relative to their parents. And so the first thing I want to do is discuss a study that my colleagues and I did a few years ago, where we set about to assess the extent to which uh, America actually lives up to that aspiration. What fraction of kids actually go on to earn more than their parents did? We're measuring both kids and parents, just a very simple statistic, what fraction of children earned more than their parents did based on the year in which kids were born. And so if you look uh, at the data, starting here on the left with kids born back in the 1940s, you see that in the 1940s and 1950s for children born in the middle of the last century, it was a virtual guarantee that you were gonna achieve the American dream of moving up. 92% of children born in 1940 went on to earn more than their parents did. Now, if you look at what has happened over time on your screen, you see a dramatic fading of the American dream such that for children born in the mid 1980s, for whom we're measuring incomes today when they're in their 30s, it's now become a coin flip, a 50-50 shot as to whether you're gonna achieve the American dream of moving up. Now, this dramatic trend is of course of great interest to economists that illustrates a fundamental change in the US economy that we're interested in understanding. But I would argue it's of broader interest to social scientists and the public in general, because it underlies, I think, some of the major trends that people are discussing in the US, the political, uh, outcomes that we're seeing, the frustration that people are, are expressing around the country, that the U.S. is no longer a place where it's easy to get ahead. And so that's the backdrop for what I want to talk about today, motivated by this dramatic trend in our research group at Harvard, Opportunity Insights. We are focused essentially on trying to understand what is driving that trend and what we might be able to do to try to restore the American dream and give more kids chances of rising up. So now that is, of course, a topic that lots of people have been interested in for many decades. And I know lots of folks who are listening today uh, at Duke from uh, various departments have done very important work on. Our angle in thinking about these issues is to focus specifically on using big data to study how to increase upward mobility. So big data, of course, is a buzzword often used in Silicon Valley these days. You hear a lot about big data in the context of private companies like Amazon and Google using large data sets to improve the products they offer. Analogously, our vision, and I think a growing trend in the social sciences, is to use modern large-scale data sets to address important economic and social policy questions, in this particular case, how we can increase opportunities for upward mobility. Now, what we do is use various types of data, which I'll discuss with you uh, in this talk, 
to analyze a broad range of interventions to increase upward mobility. So, you know, you might naturally think about things like a focus on education or early childhood intervention or health or, uh, you know, a variety of different things. We are not going to pick any one particular domain. Rather, we're going to organize things from a life course perspective, looking at a variety of interventions from childhood to adulthood. And you'll see why I think that more holistic perspective makes a lot of sense when you look at these data. I apologize. I think I got, uh, were you able to see the map that I just put up? I just want to know where I, I lost the internet connection. We did not, excuse me, we did not see the map. Okay, so let me start there. Um, sorry about this. Are you seeing the map now, Anna? Yes. Great, okay, Thanks. so j just to start again uh, on this. So there are very sharp local differences in rates of upward mobility across areas. Uh, and so what I wanna do now is dive in to show you that data, which I think can be very useful in understanding what the broader drivers are of the trends in upward mobility that I was showing you and point a way to, to potential interventions. Uh, and so, to do that, I'm uh, going to discuss this map, which I'll first describe. I'll, let me discuss how it's constructed. Uh, and then I'll discuss what we learned from it and how to interpret it. So what we're doing here is taking data on 20 million kids from anonymized tax returns linked to their parents, essentially all kids born in the United States in the early 1980s. And what we do is map kids back to where they were born. Uh, and look at what their outcomes in adulthood look like across different areas. So specifically, we divide the U.S. into 740 different metro and rural areas. Uh, and in each of those areas, we're computing a simple measure of upward mobility. We're computing the average income at age 35 for kids who grew up in low-income families, families at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution. That's a household income of something like $27,000 a year. And so in each of these areas, we take the set of kids who are growing up in families at that income level, and we ask, where did they themselves end up 35 years later in the income distribution as adults? We color the map so that blue-green colors represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility, and red-orange colors represent areas with lower levels of upward mobility. So if you start by looking at the scale in the lower right here, you can see that there's an incredible spectrum in terms of rates of upward mobility across different parts of the United States. In places like the center of the country, take Dubuque, Iowa, for example, kids growing up in low-income families there um, have average incomes in adulthood of $45,000 a year. So that's a move up from a household income of $27,000 to $45,000 across one generation, quite a substantial amount of upward mobility. By contrast, if you look at the other end of the spectrum, Charlotte, North Carolina, a couple of hours from where you all are, uh, you see that kids who are growing up in families with a comparable level of income and only 26,300 a year. So no progress across generations. More broadly, you know, you can see the geographic variation for yourself. Uh, much of the Southeast and the industrial Midwest, cities like Cleveland and Cincinnati have very low rates of upward mobility the coasts and much of the center of the country have much higher rates of upward mobility. So, it, you know, the, what I'm gonna do in this talk is essentially try to understand what is driving the variation in this map and what that means in terms of 
what we can do going forward to increase rates of upward mobility in the more red and orange colored areas. And these data really provide us now an unprecedented lens to be able to study these issues in a very granular way, because when you see this type of sharp variation, like you see in this map, and like I'm gonna show you in more detail, you can start to understand what is different about the blue green colored areas on this map relative to the red areas, which can then point uh, the ways to, to understanding mechanisms and interventions. Now, before I go on to assess potential explanations, um, throughout this talk, I'm gonna be focused primarily on income as uh, the outcome of interest, but I know there are lots of folks here who are coming from the med school and are interested in health issues. And although I'm an economist and economists tend to focus on income, we do recognize that there are lots of other outcomes that are important in people's lives, but beyond the amount that they're earning. One reason to focus on income is that it's something that we can measure quite well. And it's very strongly correlated with a variety of other life outcomes that we might care about directly. And so I just wanna show you that directly from the same sort of data before moving on to, to understand the drivers of what I just showed you in the map. And I'm gonna do that by taking one simple measure of health outcomes that we've looked at in our group, again, using tax data here linked to uh, social security death records for the entire US population. Um, this is from a paper in JAMA a few years ago where we look at how life expectancy varies by income in the US and across areas. And the main point I wanna make is that there are very closely related patterns between health outcomes and the income economic outcomes that I'm gonna focus on in this lecture today. And so just as one simple illustration of that, this chart here is plotting life expectancy at age 40 for men in the United States by their income percentile. And what you can see is that there's an incredibly strong gradient here where men in the top 1% of the income distribution live about 15 years longer on average than men in the bottom 1%. So just to put that magnitude in context, as some of you might know, uh, the CDC estimates that if we were to eliminate cancer as a cause of death, we would increase life expectancy by an average of 3.2 years in the US. Here, we're seeing a 15 year gap, important uh, disparity. For women, you also see quite a substantial gap, although it's narrower, 10 years instead of 15 years. The broader point uh, that I wanna make here is just that while I'm gonna focus on one particular set of outcomes, through a series of analyses, this chart and a variety of other things, if we look at education outcomes, if we look at health outcomes, we look at a variety of social outcomes, these things, they're not identical in every case, but they kind of move as a bundle. And so you can see the economic focus that I'm gonna talk about here as applying more broadly to the types of problems you uh, might be interested in. So coming now back to uh, the, the map that I just showed you on the geography of upward mobility in the, the US. The way I'm gonna structure uh, the next part of the talk is basically to put up different explanations. You might already have a few in your mind on what is driving this variation and evaluate each of them empirically and try to get a sense of what is driving this variation? What does that teach us about the drivers of upward mobility? So the first explanation that economists often think of when presented with this map is maybe this is about differences in the labor markets across areas. So maybe the types of jobs that you can get in a place like San Francisco, you know, booming tech economy are different than the types of jobs that you can get in a city like Cincinnati. Uh, and maybe that's what's driving the differences in upward mobility across areas. That'd be a very natural explanation of what's going on. So a first clue that that might not be what's going on comes from right in the region where you are. If you look at Charlotte, as you probably know, Charlotte is one of the booming economies of the United States. It's sort of the engine of job growth in the South. If you look at any traditional metric of economic success, the growth in jobs over the past 20 years, the growth of wage rates, anything like that, Charlotte would come out near the top of that list. Yet, as you can see here, Charlotte ranks 50th out of the 50 largest cities in America uh, in terms of rates of upward mobility for low-income kids who grow up there. Raleigh, uh, again, ranks, you know, I think at the bottom five in, in that list. So these cities in the Southeast, even though they are really rapidly growing, they don't have very high rates of upward mobility. If I generalize based on that example and plot rates of upward mobility, the data that I was showing you on the map 
on the vertical axis here against job growth rates from 1990 to 2010, you can see that there's basically no relationship between these two things. You have cities like Charlotte and Atlanta that have incredibly high growth rates, yet somehow you don't have high rates of upward mobility there. And then you have other cities like Minneapolis that don't have particularly high growth rates, but have pretty good rates of upward mobility for low-income kids who grow up there. So you might ask, first of all, how is just how is this even possible mechanically? How can you have... Great. So uh, I was giving the example of Charlotte and Atlanta, which are places with high job growth, yet don't have high rates of of upward mobility. And so, you know, what that shows you is the first explanation, the most natural economic explanation doesn't really hold water, I think, that it seems like it's about more than just the, the nature of differences in labor markets across places. Okay, so that was explanation number one. I don't think uh, that's what's going on. It shows you that just trying to have high growth rates in your city is not necessarily the solution. Second potential explanation. So anyone familiar with the demography of the United States uh, would recognize that there's a potential link to race here. So in particular, places with larger African-American populations, the Southeast, cities like Cleveland and Detroit, tend to be the ones that are in the red colors here, right? And we all know that there's a long history of racial disparities in the United States. So perhaps that's what explains the differences that we're seeing in these maps, that Black kids have lower chances of climbing the income ladder than white kids, and that's showing up as this spatial variation. So to evaluate that, uh, what we did next in a subsequent paper is linked data from tax returns to census data for the US population. So now you have information on everyone's race and ethnicity. And so then you can do an analysis like this, where you can construct the same maps that I was just showing you separately for black men on the left and white men on the right. Now, this is exactly the same statistics we were talking about before. Take kids growing up in low-income families and ask how much are they earning as adults separately for black men and white men. And you'll see in a second why I'm breaking this down by gender. And so the first thing I want you to, to notice here is, you know, if you just look at these two maps side by side, you might think, oh, they put these two maps on two different color scales, kind of a red-orange color scale on the left and a blue-green color scale on the right. But in fact, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see that we have not put the maps on a different scale. They're on the same scale. Rather, what this is illustrating is how stark the racial divide is in the United States. There's no understating how important race is in America. It's essentially like they're two different countries in terms of economic opportunity for black men versus white men. The very best places in terms of upward mobility for black men, place like Boston, has lower levels of income on average than the very worst places in upward mobility for white men, places like Charlotte, for example. And so that shows you how important race is, in fact. Uh, that being said, there's still a substantial amount of difference across places, even for people of a given race. So if you look for white men, you look at places like Appalachia, rates of upward mobility are much lower than you see in other parts of the country. So race matters tremendously, but so does place. Now, I just showed you these data for men. Interestingly, if you draw the same pair of maps for women, you see an extremely different pattern. So notice in particular that the spectrum of colors that you're seeing in the map on the left and the map on the right are essentially overlapping. And more broadly, if we look at a variety of different outcomes, rates of economic mobility for black and white women don't look all that different from each other. And so that's useful in potentially understanding what might be driving racial disparities. There really seems to be an intersectionality between race and gender. There's something about uh, the challenges that black men face in particular that are extremely important. Now, throughout this talk, I'm gonna focus primarily on upward mobility because I think that's what a lot of us care about. How can we help the most disadvantaged rise up? But particularly in, uh, when we're studying racial disparities, it's quite useful and I think illuminating to also study the converse phenomenon of downward mobility. Take a set of kids who start out in high income families and ask where they end up based on their race. And so I'm gonna do that using this uh, nice visual that the New York Times created using uh, the data that we put out, which shows you rates of downward mobility for black men shown in the purple dots versus white men shown in the green dots. And so what this is showing you is taking a set of kids who grew up 
in high income families in the top fifth of the income distribution. And it's asking, where did these kids themselves end up as adults? Do they end up in the bottom fifth, the second fifth, or do they stay in the top fifth? And what you can see, I think, is one of the most disheartening patterns I've found in our research, which is that if you look at black men, the purple dots, you see this tremendous cascade toward the bottom where black kids, even black kids who grew up in quite affluent families are almost as likely to end up at the bottom of the income distribution in the next generation as they are to stay at the top. Whereas the green dots kind of float at the top. If you started out in a high income family as a white man, you tend to be high income in the next generation as well. And so what this means, the reason I think this is so important is it illustrates why we have such a persistence of racial disparities in the US. The way I think about it visually is that for white Americans, achieving the American dream is like climbing an income ladder. Whereas for black Americans, it's more like being on a treadmill where even after you climb up in one generation, there are tremendous structural forces that push you back down and make you have to make the climb again. And unless you fix that treadmill, you're never gonna get a convergence of the black white gap. And so, you know, the key takeaway from this, I think is race matters. And in particular, race matters even among high income folks. So there's a lot of focus on how do we help black kids in more disadvantaged communities. But what this shows is it's equally important to think about how you help uh, black kids in middle class and affluent communities where we're continuing to see substantial disparities in outcomes. Okay, so all of that is showing you that race is in fact a very important piece of, of what is going on and needs to be addressed in its own right, I think, independent of some of the other factors that I'm gonna talk about next. But coming now again back to the map here, let me take a next step now in um, trying to understand what's driving these differences for people of a given race. And the next thing that I'm gonna do following in kind of our process of discovery here and in, in understanding what's driving this variation is to zoom in to a much more local level. So it turns out when you look at this map, you know, your eye naturally gravitates towards this broad regional variation between say the Midwest and the Southeast uh, and so forth. Um, what I wanna do now is show you that a lot of this variation actually arises at a much more local level across different city blocks within a given place. And so the way that I'm gonna do that uh, to show you that data is to toggle over to um, a, a tool called the Opportunity Atlas, uh, which is an interactive tool that you can access yourself on the web. And you should be seeing this map here on the screen on this website uh, where you can just go to opportunityatlas.org. And so what I'm gonna do is here, just type in uh, Duke University. And uh, so to zoom into, let's go to the Duke Hospital. Um, and that's gonna zoom in, show you the same kind of statistics we've been talking about right around where you all are. Uh, and so, you know, the very first thing I would uh, like you to note, so there's no data here right on the Duke campus because you don't have people living there, but you know, I can click on any one of these census tracts. So we're looking at the data census tract by census tract now. And you can look at the same statistics that I've been talking about all along. What are the average outcomes in adulthood of kids who grew up in low-income families right here, you know, in different parts of, of Durham. And so the first thing that I'd uh, like you to see is that you're seeing a substantial amount of variation in outcomes across different areas in the Durham area. Uh, in particular, if you just look at the spectrum of colors on, on your screen, you're seeing the full spectrum from the darkest reds to the deepest blues, uh, just within a few miles, you know, in the Durham area, right? So you can basically go from Alabama to Iowa in terms of rates of upward mobility just by going a few miles down the street in Durham. And that's true you know, in cities across the United States. Now you all are much more familiar with the geography of the area than I am. One thing I was struck by is just how dramatic some of this variation is, particularly if you look at some of these uh, neighborhoods in, uh, on the east side of, of the campus. So I'm, what I'm gonna do here is look at kids growing up in the lowest income families, and in particular, look at black kids given some of the racial disparities that, that we were just talking about. And so to take uh, you know, one example that I was just looking at, and I'm gonna zoom in here in particular on black men. If I click on this neighborhood here, uh, which is uh, in uh, East Durham, um, you can see that the average 
income in adulthood for black men growing up in the census tract is just $4,500. Okay, so that is shockingly low to have an average income for kids growing up in a given place of $4,500. How does that happen? The way that happens is a huge fraction of those kids are not working at all as adults. They have zero incomes and we follow all of those kids like, like everybody else. And why is it that they have zero uh, incomes? Well, you can look at a variety of other outcomes in these data that we've assembled. In particular, you can look at incarceration rates and you see, I think, a, a very disturbing statistic here, which is that 38% of the black men who grew up in this neighborhood in, in Durham are incarcerated on a single day, the date of the 2010 census. And so if 38% of the kids are incarcerated on a given day, you know, something like 50 or 60% are gonna be incarcerated at some point in their life. And naturally that's gonna to lead to incredibly low incomes, right? And very poor outcomes overall. So that I think is really strikingly unfortunate, uh, poor outcomes. But now if you go, you know, just a few miles away down here, not necessarily to the more affluent parts of the city, but, you know, just a little bit further south, you know, you look down here, you have a 6% incarceration rate as opposed to 38% and, and commensurately much higher levels of income and so forth. And so, you know, all of this is to illustrate that the variation in upward mobility that we've been discussing arises not, you know, in the difference across regions or even across state lines, it's actually just across neighborhoods in your own city. And to me, that is an incredibly empowering and encouraging result because it shows that you don't need to look to different countries or a different time period to think about a time when prospects for rising up look much better. You can actually look down the street uh, and that suggests that it might be feasible to address these problems uh, you know, in a much more manageable way. And so that's exactly what I wanna talk about. What can we now think about doing in light of some of this variation? What is it that's driving this variation across uh, nearby areas? And what does that mean for policy? So to talk about that, let me come back to this slide here uh, and give you another example from the Opportunity Atlas that I'm gonna build on uh, that uh, steps towards getting a sense of what the mechanisms are here that drive this variation. And so in particular, I'm going to show you another snapshot from the Opportunity Atlas here from Charlotte, where we've been doing some work that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and here I'm going to compare two nearby neighborhoods, again, that have very different outcomes for, for Black men. Uh, Boulevard homes, where you see average incomes in adulthood of $15,000 a year versus Old Whitehall just next door, where you see average incomes in adulthood of $31,000 a year. So what I wanna do is understand why is it that we're seeing these very sharp differences across areas. And so the first thing that as social scientists, we wonder about when seeing this kind of variation is how much of this is a causal effect of place? So how much is it that if I take a given kid and put that kid in old Whitehall instead of Boulevard Homes, I'm gonna see very different outcomes for that kid. And how much is it that there's their sorting effects? So just the, the, the type of people who live in Boulevard homes might be different in terms of their education or family background relative to the type of people who live in old white home. So that's a classic question in sociology and economics that goes back many decades. Parsing that apart has proven to be quite challenging, but we and others have done a series of studies in recent years that I think have shed some light on how much of this is a causal effect and what's driving these differences. And so in particular, what we do is track millions of families that move across areas and look at how their kids' outcomes change when they move to a different neighborhood. Rather than getting into the statistical details of that study, what I'm gonna do here is just summarize what we find in the context of this example. So I'm gonna do that using this chart here. So imagine you've got a set of kids that move, whose families move from Boulevard Homes to Old Whitehall with kids at different ages. And so let's imagine first a set of kids who move when they're exactly two from Boulevard Homes to Old Whitehall. So what we do is track those kids forward 30 years using tax records, measure their own incomes in adulthood. And we see in this first point here that those kids have average incomes in adulthood of about $24,000 a year. So that's for the kids who move when they're exactly two. Now let's repeat that analysis for kids who move when they're three, four, five, and so on. And what you see is this very clear declining pattern 
the later you make that move from Boulevard Homes to Old Whitehall, the less of a gain you get. And if you move after you're in your early 20s, you get absolutely no gain at all. So what do you see from this chart? I think there are three key takeaways. First, it looks like places really do have a causal effect on kids' outcomes. Taking a given child and helping that child move from a place like Boulevard Homes to Old Whitehall leads to dramatic improvements in that child's life outcomes. Second, what really seems to matter is where you're living as a kid and not necessarily where you're living as an adult. We see here and in a variety of other studies that moves made in adulthood have relatively small impacts on economic outcomes. Third, you see kind of a dosage effect. Every extra year that you spend growing up in a higher upward mobility area, a greener colored area on the maps that I've been showing you, the better you yourself do as an adult, right? So additional exposure, if you move at five instead of six or 10 instead of 12, every extra year of exposure seems to be helpful in improving longer run outcomes. And that's important because it shows that it's not just the very earliest child of years that determine kids' life trajectories. Moving to a better area, even when you're 15 instead of 20, can have quite a substantial impact. So we should be thinking about childhood environment throughout the course of childhood, not just in the very earliest years. So now the, the next step in kind of uncovering the puzzle, we've seen that childhood environment really seems to be a key factor. So naturally you're probably wondering, okay, so what is it about a place like Boulevard Homes, these neighborhoods that have you know, higher levels of upward mobility, what are they doing differently from places like uh, 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 Old Whitehall? Why is it that Old Whitehall has better outcomes than, than Boulevard Homes? So that is a very difficult question to answer. It's one that we and many others are studying at the moment. What I'm gonna do here is summarize four factors that seem to be highly predictive of these differences in outcomes across areas. So we've looked at a variety of different factors that sociologists and economists have proposed over the years as potential de determinants of upward mobility. And just in the interest of time, I'm highlighting the four strongest correlates of these differences in upward mobility that we found. So let me just read them off and then I'll, I'll discuss in a bit more detail. So the first is lower poverty rates. Communities that are more mixed income tend to generate higher rates of upward mobility. Interestingly, they don't tend to have worse outcomes for higher income people, suggesting that it might be possible that more integrated communities benefit the poor without harming the rich. Second, uh, places with more stable family structures, more two-parent families, for instance, tend to have higher rates of upward mobility. Third, as you might expect intuitively, places with better schools, public schools in particular, measured in various ways, tend to have higher uh, rates of upward mobility. And then finally, one of the strongest predictors uh, we found and something we're really focusing on in our research at present is that places with greater social capital tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. So what is social capital it can be kind of a nebulous concept. The way I think about it is uh, the old adage that it takes a village to raise a child. Will someone else help you out even if you're not doing well? You know, think of a place like Salt Lake City with the Mormon church, often thought to be a canonical example of a place with a lot of social capital. Salt Lake City is one of the cities with the highest rates of upward mobility in our data. More generally, places that look like that tend to have high levels of upward mobility. In our ongoing work, we're using data from social networks to measure social capital much more precisely. And in a study we hope to release later this year, we'll be able to speak about that uh, much more precisely. But that strikes me as one you know, particularly important factor here. So this, you know, these are correlated predictive factors. They don't necessarily point to causal mechanisms. But what, what I think they tell us is that these differences across areas in terms of upward mobility, they don't come from just one particular thing like differences in schools or uh, you know, differences in the availability of affordable housing. It's, it's a mix of different factors that really seem to matter. And so I think multifaceted approaches to trying to tackle these issues to improve economic outcomes, to improve health outcomes uh, could be very valuable. And so motivated by that, in the remaining uh, few minutes before we open it up to questions, I wanna talk about how we can take this research base that I've been sharing with you here to translate that to changes in policy um, and you know, what, what this means in terms of how we can take action to increase upward mobility in our own communities. And the way we've been organizing uh, our thinking along those lines is to consider three different approaches to, to increasing upward mobility. 
that I think arise directly from the research findings that I've been sharing with you. So the way I would summarize and essentially one line what I've shown you so far is that the origins of the American dream are incredibly granular. They seem to arise at a very local level. And in particular, it's childhood environment until kids are age 22 or 23, something like that, that really shapes kids' prospects for upward mobility at a hyper-local level. We estimate that it's something like conditions in a half mile radius around your house that really seem to be key in determining your later outcomes. So if you have that view of the world, that the American dream is shaped by uh, local differences in childhood environment, I think you would naturally think about three different ways to address the problem. The first is to try to help people move to higher opportunity areas. If we see much higher opportunity you know, on the west side of Durham than the east side, well, maybe we can just help lower income folks to move to, to uh, you know, some of these neighborhoods that have higher levels of upward mobility. So I think of that as essentially trying to reduce segregation. And you know, that's one potential approach that we might think about that I'll, that I'll talk about in a second. A second approach, recognizing that you can't possibly help everyone move to a higher opportunity area, is to figure out how you increase upward mobility in the red colored parts of the maps that I've been showing you. So how can you make strategic place-based investments to improve economic and health outcomes in those areas? And I'll talk a bit about how we're thinking about that. And then finally, recognizing that after age 18, the key touch point for many kids is not where they live, uh, where they grew up in, at home, but rather where they attend college, I think there's a potential role that institutions of higher education can play in increasing pathways to upward mobility as well. So let me spend a few minutes talking about each of these uh, different approaches, uh, and then I'll conclude. So uh, let's start with the reducing segregation approach. So here I'm going to talk about some work that we're doing on the ground in Seattle to help families move to higher opportunity areas and how that provides a pathway to scaling uh, to national policy changes. So to set this up, um, let me note, as some of you might know, that we spend a tremendous amount of money in the United States on affordable housing programs that are intended to give families access to higher opportunity neighborhoods. We spend about $45 billion per year on various affordable housing programs, the biggest component of which are vouchers that about 2 million families get that give them assistance in paying rent. Uh, so in the Seattle area, you get a voucher that's worth something like $1,500 a month uh, if, if you receive one of these housing vouchers. So when we put out this Opportunity Atlas data, we started to hear from a number of housing authorities who were interested in figuring out whether they could use these data to help families move to higher opportunity neighborhoods. And so the first thing we did is we tried to figure out where are families that receive housing vouchers, where do they currently live? And so what we're doing here is overlaying in these bright green dots that you see here, the 25 most common tracks where housing voucher holders lived in Seattle on the Opportunity Atlas map for Seattle. And you can see a very striking pattern, which is that these green dots are concentrated in the red and orange colored parts of the map rather than the blue green parts of the map. So even though these families are receiving quite substantial rental assistance from the government, they are not actually using these vouchers to move to higher opportunity areas. So despite our efforts to try to break the intergenerational cycle of poverty, it doesn't look like the program's actually having that, that effect that one might hope for. And so we teamed up with the Seattle and King County housing authorities to ask, why is that the case? And can we potentially design an intervention on the ground to help families with housing vouchers move to higher opportunity neighborhoods, taking advantage of this new data that we've constructed? And so conceptually, the question we we're trying to ask is basically, are families living in lower opportunity areas because they have a preference to do so for some other reason? Maybe it's closer to their family or to their job, or they have some other reason to want to stay in those places. Or is it that they face barriers in moving to higher opportunity areas that we might be able to address? Maybe they have a hard time finding housing in higher opportunity places. Maybe landlords don't want to rent to them, or maybe they lack a little bit of financial uh, support to pay a security deposit or something like that to, to move to one of these higher opportunity places, even though they want to. And so what we did is designed a randomized trial where about a thousand families who came in to, to get a standard housing voucher from the Seattle Housing Authority were split into two groups randomly. And the treatment group 
uh, received essentially assistance in the search process, some short-term financial assistance. Think of it as kind of brokerage services to help you move to a high opportunity area if you wanted to do so. The control group just received the standard services that you always get in the US housing voucher program. And so what we did is essentially compare what happened in terms of where families chose to move when they got this additional assistance. And the results I think are quite striking. If you look at the control group that did not receive any additional assistance, only 14% of families moved to high opportunity areas in the top third of the distribution in, in King County. In contrast, in the treatment group, more than half of the families moved to high opportunity neighborhoods. And this, I should emphasize, is an intervention that costs about $2,000. It's not a small sum, but relative to the on average, about $100,000 that we're spending on the voucher over many years when families receive this voucher, it's only something like a 2% increment in the cost of the program, but it dramatically shifts where families end up choosing to live and where kids are growing up. And you can see that in this map here where the green pins show you where families in the treatment group chose to move and the red pins show you where families in the control group chose to move. And you can see that the, the blue shaded regions are the high opportunity parts of the Seattle metro area. And you can see that the green pins are scattered throughout the higher opportunity neighborhoods rather than the lower opportunity places. And we estimate that on average, just as a result of the simple intervention, the kids who are in these families in the green pins are gonna go on to earn an additional $200,000 or so over their lifetimes relative to the families in the red pins. And so that's a, a simple change to a very large existing program that we think could meaningfully reduce segregation and increase upward mobility quite substantially, illustrating how I think this type of research can really lead to uh, meaningful change on the ground. Encouragingly, uh, I think that kind of work can actually have an impact on policy, even in the, the polarized climate uh, in which we live. So, you know, this gives you an example where there's now uh, been a bill passed with bipartisan support uh, that has authorized $60 million to do what we did in Seattle in cities across the country. Uh, and there's additional discussion to expand the housing voucher program by an additional $5 billion per year with these sorts of supports to help more families across America move to higher opportunity neighborhoods. So that's one concrete way that I think we can tackle some of these issues and increase opportunity. But I wanna emphasize, as many of you are probably thinking, you know, surely that can't be the, the scalable path to trying to increase opportunity for everyone across the US. And so I wanna spend a few minutes talking about our ongoing work in these other two dimensions that I think are complementary to this approach of reducing segregation. So when uh, we uh, look at these neighborhoods that have lower levels of opportunity, you know, maybe some folks want to move to higher opportunity areas and we can try to facilitate those choices, but there are going to be lots of folks who can't or don't want to move to a different neighborhood. And so how can we bring opportunity to them? So what I want to do here is I don't have an answer to give you on that front. What I'm going to do is talk about how we're trying to address the problem and in particular talk about some work we're doing in Charlotte, uh, which is a city where we've spent a lot of time because of this fact that Charlotte ranks 50th out of 50 in terms of rates of upward mobility. And so when we put out that study, uh, people in Charlotte noticed and we got a lot of uh, interest from folks in Charlotte. I found in a very encouraging way where it wasn't so much, you know, attempting to disagree with what the study had shown, but rather to ask, as they say in you know, the local newspaper here, how on the one hand can we be such a vital and opportunity-rich community, but on the other hand, be ranked dead last in the odds that our lowest income children and youth will be able to move up the economic ladder. And so motivated by this, Charlotte set up a commission that involved a lot of the key corporate players and government uh, folks in the city to try to understand what is driving this problem. And uh, what our team did in combination with them is try to identify a set of potential interventions from early childhood to later in adulthood that could potentially be relevant. And so there are lots of different things that people are trying to give kids in lower income families a better chance. Uh, you know, ideally we'd have evidence on which of these exactly works for different types of kids and so forth. And what we're trying to do is evaluate these types of programs systematically. Uh, 
you know, we don't know yet exactly what the answer is, but what I think is encouraging is you have examples, for example, if you look at the lower right here, uh, this program called Year Up, which is a, a tailored job training program targeted at lower income kids. Uh, that program has been shown through randomized trials to increase earnings by 30%. And now Bank of America, in light of the type of data that I've been showing you here, you know, which is headquartered in Charlotte, has committed to hiring a thousand people from the local community in partnership with Europe to provide the relevant skills for those Bank of America jobs. And so those kinds of investments, I think, could have a meaningful impact on upward mobility in Charlotte. And by studying these types of programs, we hope to have a better answer going forward uh, using longitudinal data on what kinds of place-based investments can actually work. So the last thing I want to talk about in the last couple of minutes is um, the, this final domain of higher education, which I think is particularly relevant for all of us, uh, given the institutions that, that we are at. You know, what role uh, can colleges play in increasing upward mobility? And so the way that I'm going to do that is uh, by showing you this chart here, um, which shows you two key dimensions that matter for colleges' contribution to upward mobility. So in other work that we've done with similar data, we have put out publicly available statistics on how much every college in America is contributing to upward mobility. And the way we do that is basically thinking about two statistics. On the vertical axis is a simple measure of the upward mobility rate for students at a given college. So in particular, the, the measure we're looking at here is if you take the set of kids who come from families in the bottom 20%, what fraction reach the top 20%? Now, every dot here is a different college in America. And so if we look here, for instance, at the, at the dot for Duke, we see that 50% of the kids who come from low-income families end up reaching the top 20% of the income distribution themselves. So Duke ranks you know, very high in the distribution of colleges in terms of upward mobility near the very top. Uh, for the low-income kids who attend Duke. But of course, when you think about the contribution of a place like Duke to upward mobility, what matters is not just how low-income kids who attend Duke do, but how many low-income kids there are on campus to begin with. And on that dimension, as you can see, Duke has relatively few low-income kids, right? Relative to other colleges in the, in the local area, uh, you know, only something like 5% of kids or less come from the, the bottom 20% of the income distribution. Now, uh, so you know, the question in some sense then, if you wanna think about how you increase upward mobility, the contribution to upward mobility is for places like Duke or Harvard, which is up here as well in the upper left, how do you move those points to the right side of the chart? How do you increase access for low-income kids? And then conversely, for some of the local community colleges, how can you think about improving outcomes for, for low-income kids in those places? Now, concretely, I think there are significant challenges that elite private institutions face, even despite the efforts that have been made over the past 10 years to increase access. And so just to illustrate that, this is pooling data for the Ivy Plus colleges, the Ivy League colleges, plus Stanford, MIT, Duke, and Chicago, showing you the fraction of kids who come from each percentile of the income distribution. And what is striking here is that you see, you know, 15% of kids at these colleges come from families in the top 1% of the income distribution, that is families earning more than about $650,000 a year. Uh, and so, you know, there are more kids from the top 1% of the income distribution at these colleges than the bottom 50% combined. And that I think really limits their capacity to increase upward mobility. If you have no low-income kids on campus to begin with, obviously, no matter how good a job you do in propelling those few kids who are there, you're gonna have a limited impact on upward mobility in the country as a whole. And so what we are doing now is uh, in partnership with 400 colleges across the US, we're trying to understand how one can make progress on those two dimensions, increasing access to qualified low-income students at colleges that have very good outcomes and how you can maximize success for kids from disadvantaged backgrounds at places like community colleges that serve many low-income kids, uh, but currently don't have great outcomes. Okay, so I hope I've illustrated a bunch of different dimensions on which I think we can make significant progress, especially with modern data. I wanna end by talking about, you know, recognizing that we're doing this talk remotely, we're in a very unique moment. 
uh, here in our history in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, you know, many people often ask me when I present all this material, which we had been working on pre-COVID, what are the implications of this pandemic, this historic crisis for economic opportunity and these issues in the United States? And so I just wanna show you uh, data that pertains to the pandemic that we have been tracking uh, in our group uh, when the pandemic struck that I think shows you how these issues are gonna be even more amplified given the current crisis. And so I'll show you two quick pieces of, of evidence on that. So first, if you look at what happened to employment rates in the US when the pandemic hit in uh, March last year, you can see that they fell very sharply as you know from reading the news, but in particular, they fell very sharply for the lowest income folks in the US in the bottom wage quartile. And strikingly, they have not recovered even in recent months. Whereas for high income folks, you see a V-shaped pattern that you often read about in the news, where within a few weeks, you were back to baseline levels of employment. And so this type of pattern where we have these enormous disparities that have opened up in terms of employment, I think does not bode well for economic opportunities for lower income folks going forward in the coming years. Even more worrisome, thinking about the next generation and linking back now to the set of issues I, I talked about in this lecture today, if we look at what has happened to kids' outcomes, which we've been tracking through the pandemic here using data from an online math learning platform called Zern, which about a million kids use in the US as part of their school curriculum, you can see that the number of math lessons that kids from low-income families completed when schools went remote in mid-March last year fell dramatically and never really recovered uh, over the course of the school year. And even in this school year, after schools had time to recalibrate, we've had about a 20% gap open up in terms of the number of math lessons that low-income kids are completing relative to high-income kids, right? So that's like low-income kids are going to school one day less a week than high-income kids. So even all the existing disparities that, that were there, I think are dramatically amplified in the current crisis. Uh, and so I, to me, you know, this makes the broader set of issues that we've been talking about, the challenges that the US faces, all the more important in the current crisis. And so let me end by coming back to the chart that I started out with. I think we've witnessed over the past 50 years a dramatic change in the US that has made opportunities for upward mobility much harder to come by. Unfortunately, I think the present crisis only makes these problems more urgent. But to end on a more optimistic note, I think, uh, you know, if we think about the, the saying that uh, people sometimes quote that uh, we should never let a crisis go to waste, I think it's unique crises like these that really give us an opportunity to reorganize how society is structured. And coming out of the Great Depression, the fundamental changes in US social programs and infrastructure, I think that's what led to decades of inclusive growth in the United States and some of the highest rates of economic opportunity. And I think informed by modern data, modern science, there's an opportunity to do that again in the United States. And I very much hope uh, many of the folks on this call will be able to participate in that effort. So thanks very much. And everything that I've presented here is accessible on our website. And I hope some of these data and tools will be useful to all of you in your own work. Thank you so much, Dr. Chetty, for a really compelling presentation. We have had a very lively uh, set of questions coming through the chat. And so I know uh, folks are going to be interested in hearing from you on a number of issues. Um, I'm going to try to group them together. So as you can imagine, um, many of the folks who are listening today have um, some ideas about um, potential mechanisms or other things that might be going on that they are hoping to hear you speak on. Uh, one thing that has come up in several questions is issues around gentrification. Uh, this is actually something that is very relevant in our ongoing conversation right here in Durham. And by zooming in on East Durham, you may not have realized it, but that is an area that has historically faced a lot of challenges and is now experiencing uh, a lot of gentrification. And so that kind of crystallized, I think, in many of our listeners' uh, minds what role gentrification might be playing um, when uh, individuals with higher incomes are moving into areas that are lower opportunity areas is that, do you imagine, for example, that that would improve opportunities for children 
living in those areas. So could you start by just talking a little bit about gentrification? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we are exactly at this moment conducting a couple of studies that focus on exactly the variation you described, Anna, looking with these longitudinal data at places, sounds like, like East Durham, where higher income folks are moving in, trying to understand what implications that has for lower income folks. I'll say a couple of things, although you know we don't, I don't have the direct answer yet from that type of analysis. Um, you know, one concern is that people get displaced, right? And so even if those neighborhoods look better when you're kind of driving around, uh, it's unclear whether the people who lived there before actually benefited because they might have had to move to a different place, or you know, maybe they're not even benefiting benefiting at all from the from the change in the in the neighborhood. So from, I, I think a key challenge that's going to arise is how you sort of do gentrification right in the sense that places are inevitably going to gentrify. You know, some places may get wealthier and that could potentially benefit lower income folks. And my sense is they can, it can potentially, it can particularly benefit them if you create the type of interaction in public schools, for example, that uh, you know, we see is associated with better outcomes for lower income kids. So let me contrast two different versions of gentrification. Imagine higher income folks move in and send their kids to private schools and essentially have no connection to lower income people in the area. My guess is that that has much less of a, a benefit, um, even though it may bring in some resources, tax base and so forth, uh, relative to if there's actually an interaction uh, occurring in public schools. And, you know, that type of thing can potentially be addressed through policy, right? That people make these choices in light of what schools look like in a given place, in light of how things are zoned and so forth. And so I, I don't think there's going to be a single answer on gentrification is always good or bad. I think it's going to be, how do you do this in a way that generates the best outcomes? Thank you. Another thought that um, some of our participants have been wondering about, um, and this relates in particular to access to higher education is the role of debt. So when um, uh, students from lower income families are trying to access higher education, they're often borrowing money. And, um, and so if you could just talk a little bit about um, debt and uh, student debt in particular and the role that that might be playing here. Yeah. So I think debt just amplifies some of the issues that I was talking about at the end, right? So you can end up with students going to colleges where we don't really see great outcomes for kids. And then furthermore, it wasn't taken into account in that chart. You're saddled with quite a bit of debt. For example, you know, the, the salient example is for-profit colleges, where for many for-profit colleges, you don't see great outcomes uh, and there's a tremendous amount of debt. And then you know, it's even worse in terms of uh, long-term prospects. Even among some of the high upward mobility institutions that were in kind of the upper left side of the chart that I showed you, students can end up with significant debt. I will note though, that it doesn't seem like financial considerations in terms of the cost of attending college by themselves are enough to explain why we see such few low income kids at places like Duke or Harvard, even after financial aid was expanded substantially at those types of institutions, such that you know, if you're coming from a lower income family, you would not have to take on a lot of debt to attend some of these colleges, even then, we have very few kids at these institutions. And so what we're trying to do now is understand why that's the case and how you can actually create greater access. Thank you so much. Um, the final kind of uh, set of mechanisms that people have been wondering about that we're hoping you might be able to say a little bit more about um, is the um, concurrent changes in family structure that have happened kind of right along the same time frame, time frame as you showed this, uh, this uh, decrease in the chances of kids in the US having upward mobility that really corresponded with the rise of um, single parent families. And so could you just talk a little bit more about the role of family structure? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, I think that the role of family structure actually is more subtle than, than one might think. So I pointed out that places with more two parent families tend to have higher rates of upward mobility. And the most intuitive explanation you'd probably think of is it's probably beneficial for kids to grow up in a two parent household than a single parent household. And maybe that's why they're they're doing better. But it, but it turns out the mechanism is actually, I think, not that. And the, the reason we know that is uh, 
even if you take kids who themselves grow up in two parent families, if you grow up in a neighborhood with more single parent families, we see that you are less likely to climb the income ladder. And so it's not, uh, it's not about whether your own parents are married or not. It seems to be something about the community. Communities where you have more single parent families tend to have lower rates of upward mobility. Now, what, why exactly that's the case? I'm not totally sure. You know, one pattern we see in the data is that the presence of fathers in a community is particularly important for boys' outcomes rather than girls' outcomes, which a number of studies have shown in recent years. And it's also race specific, in particular, if there are lots of black men present in a community, then black boys tend to do better in that community. And so naturally, you know, as we've had an increase in mass incarceration and you have more kids growing up in single parent families, not per se because there's an impact of your own parents' marital structure, but something about how that maybe destabilizes a community, changes mentors, role models, aspirations, all that seems to play uh, some role in, in shaping kids' outcomes. Thank you so much. So the next set of questions um, had to do with um, our participants really wondering about other racial or ethnic groups. Um, so I'll, I'll just ask about a couple that have come up uh, in the Q&A. Um, one is uh, one person wondering if you could say a little bit about Asian Americans who seem to have in general um, higher upward mobility and whether you've been able to look at Asian Americans in particular. Yeah, and so I apologize, you know, just because of lack of time, not being able to cover all the different groups, but all of this is on the web and you can download that data by area. You can go to that Opportunity Atlas website or a paper on race and intergenerational mobility that analyzes the patterns. And so let me briefly summarize for some of the other groups. So it is correct for Asian Americans, you tend to see high, much higher rates of upward mobility than for any other group. So low income Asian kids do particularly well. That is a phenomenon that has been well documented in the past and in other contexts. However, it turns out that that doesn't really seem to be an Asian effect as much as an immigrant effect. So if you look at Asians whose parents uh, grew up in the United States, their rates of upward mobility look identical to whites. So it's the first, it's the, it's the immigrants' kids who end up having really high rates of upward mobility. Why is that? You know, a common explanation is kind of the engineer who came over and, you know, is driving a cab in the US. So the parents have sort of a high skill level, but a low measured income. And so then it looks like the families have very high rates of upward mobility. I don't know if that's the, the only driver, but the key point is, I don't think there's some Asian effect that kind of persists across generations. It seems to be something unique to immigrants. Let me also speak to, you know, another very important and large group in the US, Hispanic uh, Americans, where, uh, there, I think there's a striking contrast relative to Black Americans. So if you look at the data at present, average incomes for Hispanics and Blacks are not that different. Um, but if you look at the trajectories across generations, Hispanic Americans have much higher rates of upward mobility and lower rates of downward mobility than Black Americans do. And so we estimate over a couple of generations, a big part of the Hispanic white income gap is going to get closed. Whereas black, the black white gap looks like it's in what an economist would call a steady state. It doesn't look like it's on a path to converging at all because of that treadmill kind of phenomenon that I was describing. So you mentioned the other groups that our listeners and participants were wondering about too. So thank you so much for that really thorough answer. Um, if we could just spend a couple minutes on some of the methodological questions that have come in. Um, Folks are wondering whether your figures are adjusted for um, cost of living differentials in different parts of the country. So yeah, very natural to wonder about differences in cost of living. Uh, the baseline maps that I was showing you do not adjust for differences in cost of living. Let me then answer that question in two ways. So first of all, empirically, if you do adjust for local differences in cost of living, local rents, price of groceries, things like that, you end up getting a map that looks almost identical to the maps that I was showing you. It's the correlation is 0.9 across areas in terms of rates of upward mobility. So conceptually, why is that the case? The reason is that upward mobility is fundamentally about the difference between kids' outcomes and parents' outcomes. Most kids 
tend to live near their parents. So while some of us here might have moved quite a bit, I think the, the statistic that people like to quote is the average kid lives 17 miles away from their mom as an adult. Uh, and so as a result, if you're living in the same place as your parents, right, cost of living is just going to move the kids and the parents both up or down together. And so the, the rate of upward mobility is not going to change. So to make that concrete, a place like New York, very expensive, is going to look worse in terms of real incomes for the child, but it's also going to look worse for the parents. And so when you think about upward mobility, New York ends up looking basically the same as it did originally. And so that's why that ends up not changing the conclusions much. And a similar question, but for inflation adjustment of these uh, earn yeah. earnings numbers. Yeah. So the inflation adjustment matters when you're comparing things over time, right? So like that right. first chart I showed about the fading American dream, the way you account for inflation is going to be crucial there uh, because you need to, you're looking at the kid's income 30 years after the parents. How do you compare those dollars? And so what we're doing is adjusting for inflation using the standard consumer price index. There's a whole debate in literature and economics on whether the consumer price index actually captures inflation correctly or not. And it gets tricky to do properly, particularly because when you have new products, um, you know, it, it becomes very difficult to figure out how do you adjust for prices, right? So if I take my iPhone here, uh, which we didn't have 30 years ago, we have to figure out how to value that iPhone. If your view is like, my life is fundamentally better, the iPhone is worth a million dollars to me, then of course, we're going to conclude that everyone today is better off than they were 30 years ago because nobody had an iPhone 30 years ago. But if you make some reasonable adjustments for how much people seem to think new products are worth following kind of the standards in the literature, you get the kind of graph that I showed you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, one of our um, questions is asking you to um, link your findings around adult earnings explicitly to the findings uh, that you briefly presented around health outcomes. And in particular, wondering if you could talk about the fact that there is some evidence that when minoritized groups uh, move up the ladder and attain economic success, they also suffer adverse uh, physical and psychological health outcomes. Um, and so just wondering if you could speak a little bit about how we think kind of holistically about um, well-being and where people end up when we, uh, in relation to this other literature? Yeah, great question. I mean, so I, you know, I at a like zooming out level kind of tried to argue that economic outcomes, health outcomes, educational outcomes, there are, there are common elements to all of those, but I don't want to overstate that. There are difference, definitely differences, as you noted right there, where even conditional on income, you can take two groups, often we see this along racial lines where we'll see very different outcomes, even for, you know, black and white family making, uh, you know, exactly the same level of income. And so, you know, I, stepping back, what I would ideally like to do is to be able to measure the full suite of outcomes and not focus, uh, you know, be forced to focus primarily on things like income. Uh, what we're able to measure well, if you take this kind of big data quantitative approach that, that we're focused on, what we're able to measure well tends to be things that the government records systematically, right? And the things that the government records tend to be things that have tax or financial implications for the government. And so from a health perspective, we end up basically um, knowing about death, which I showed you data on because that's crucial for administering things like social security. What we have much poorer data on are health outcomes along the way uh, you know, how healthy are people? For certain populations, you can have pretty good data on health expenditures like Medicare recipients and so forth. But what I think is much more poorly understood is what the evolution of health looks like, particularly prior to prior retirement. Uh, and my instinct is that, uh, although I don't think this has been shown empirically, I think local exposure um, along the lines of what I was showing you here what you're influenced by, what you're connected to early in childhood has a great influence on health outcomes, just like it does on economic outcomes, although they might not go one for one together. Let me say one more thing on that. One study I found interesting recently from an economist named uh, Maria Polyakova at Stanford um, tries to look at variation in health outcomes across areas along the lines of what we did in the JAMA paper. But what's interesting about what she's able to do is, 
look at a variety of different causes of death and look at a, you know, not just overall mortality, but a variety of different health outcomes. Uh, and uh, what she shows is it's not just that one outcome is driving these disparities, one source, one cause of death is driving the disparities. It's on all different dimensions, right? It's not just cancer, it's also heart disease. It's also a variety of different things by income group, by, by area. So it really looks like there's a common factor, perhaps stress or something like that, that seems to be a key driver of these differences across places. And so, you know, while I think naturally the literature on health focuses on how we can treat specific conditions, it does seem like there are broader social common factors, perhaps operating through stress or other mechanisms that are, are worth thinking hard about. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the wonderful things about the Sulzberger lectures is the opportunity for um, not just our uh, Duke students, staff, and faculty to participate, but also our community partners. And we've had a number of questions come in from members of our community um, who are really inspired by this presentation and would love to hear a little bit from you about how we as uh, say citizens of Durham um, or citizens of North Carolina could use these data um, to advocate for change sure. in our in our community. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks very much for that. I mean, I, uh, you know, the, the Charlotte example to me is very inspiring. It's been inspiring to our own team where people took the data, really tried to understand why they were seeing these differences across um, communities that they knew well and cared about uh, and used that. You know, most recently Bank of America has committed a billion dollars of investment to various programs in Charlotte. Uh, motivated by this very fact that, you know, they thought Charlotte was doing well, they were bringing a lot of jobs to the place, but realized they weren't actually helping the, the local residents. And so I do think, you know, uh, companies can be lobbied to, to make a difference in their local communities. I think universities can play a big role in terms of who they admit, how they connect with the local community. Do you per permit transfers from local community colleges? You know, what does the structure look like in terms of outreach to local communities, partnerships with high schools? One of the directions in which in, I'm hoping to go, you know, there are concrete things one can do, like the affordable housing program, where Durham's going to have a housing voucher program just like every other place in the U.S. And you could imagine doing what we've done in Seattle and Durham. And, uh, you know, that's a very concrete thing that folks who might have connections to the housing authority in the local area could, could do. But more broadly, what we're hoping to do over time is be able to put out these sorts of statistics year after year so people can measure progress. So I've at this point kind of been able to just give you a snapshot for a single generation. One of the things we're working toward is, you know, every year be able to release a new set of statistics for what's going on at each university in each neighborhood. One of the tricky things in studying upward mobility is if we were to literally wait to look at kids' outcomes in adulthood, I would need to wait 25 years, right, to see the, the outcomes of interest. So obviously it's hard to get that kind of real-time feedback that's really useful for figuring out what's working. So one of the projects we're, we're working on in that context is to try to identify earlier indicators that seem like good predictors of these later outcomes so that we can put out indices that can help people monitor progress and focus their attention on, on local areas. But I found, you know, just being able to spotlight things and use these data to, to start a local conversation. And just the very observation that you can make a difference on an issue as grand as the American dream in your local neighborhood can be very empowering. And so I'm delighted that, that people are interested in doing that. And could you talk a little bit more about specifically the role that um, universities and their health systems can play in addressing these issues? Yeah. So, you know, I think universities, uh, let me take the health system question in, in particular. As health researchers, you know, I think often one naturally focuses on treating a specific disease or, you know, figuring out how you provide care in a particular acute context. But I've, I've given some talks to pedi uh, pediatrics associations, for example, and I think there's a potential role for pediatricians, for example, to go beyond the immediate what does the health of, of the child look like and think more about the social context that might be driving a broader suite of outcomes that are ultimately leading to those acute conditions that you're going to see later. And I think that's probably a little bit of a different mindset than the traditional clinical mindset, but something to, something to consider and something that I think could 
have a potential impact. And it's precisely universities like Duke that I think could be leaders in, in shaping that type of approach as opposed to the more traditional practice. Thank you. Um, so uh, several questions coming in about how you uh, approach your work as a scholar and researcher. So we'll start with one question uh, specifically asking about um, the labor that goes into managing big data um, and kind of how you approach that and where you see uh, research using big data going. Yeah, so this work, as you can imagine, is incredibly labor intensive. Um, it's not, you know, the traditional social science pen and paper sitting in your office, a uh, new theory that could, you know, potentially be influential is very different from that. You're starting from a raw data set, a lot of what I was showing you here, anonymized tax records. We constructed an 8 billion row data set covering everybody in the United States over a 30 year period. As you can imagine, you know, that is not something that is super easy to do. You don't do that in like your Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and so uh, we've got a big team of about 30 people who are working together on this. Very grateful to them for, for all of their uh, efforts. Uh, lots of students and other research scientists and faculty collaborators who've been involved, an enormous number of people in the studies that I've been showing you. Um, my view more broadly is that that is the kind of structure that social science is headed toward. And I actually think that's an important for challenge for universities to think about. How do we support social science that looks a little bit more like the lab sciences going forward rather than the traditional each professor on their own? And I think that matters for everything from what is the physical structure of our buildings look like to be structured more like labs rather than individual offices to how do you set up um, incentives and collaborations such that the 30 people on the team each have their own pathway to develop a career. And so those are things that we've been trying to innovate on uh, in the background to be able to do this type of work. But you know, I think what's been really inspiring to all of us is seeing how this is really a case where the sum is much greater than the parts, what we're all able to do working together. You know, there's no possible way I could have done any of what I showed you by myself. Um, it's just tremendously more impactful than each person trying to carve off a little piece and, and do something on their own. And for those who are really inspired by this partnership in Seattle and your ability to be involved in a randomized experiment, could you say a little bit about um, opportunities and challenges related to doing uh, experiments in, in the field? Yeah. I mean, you know, what I've realized is a whole different skill set, right? Analyzing data to trying to actually change something on the ground. And we were very lucky to have incredible partners in Seattle and King County who really drove the ship on that. And so one of the things we've developed in our team motivated by that is we don't just have researchers, but we have a set of folks that we've hired from the policy world who've been involved in trying to change programs like that to help us translate the research findings to, to policy change. And I think that's again, something that's very important for social scientists and academics uh, to think about. And I found that the power of big data is something I think I hadn't quite appreciated going into this is it can lead to a personalization that can be very valuable in, in enabling action, right? So if I had presented this talk at a more abstract level without being able to show you data for Durham or for Duke, my senses would have a very different feel than being able to see how things are playing out in, in your own community. Um, and I think that's more and more gonna be the case going forward where traditionally we tried to have kind of one size fits all answers. If you asked economists, how do we address problem X? You would get many different theories, but kind of this is the general answer. I think increasingly we're seeing the answer in Durham is different from the answer in Seattle and it's different from the answer in, here in Boston. Uh, and that kind of personalization is gonna facilitate collaboration with people on the ground who bring a, a very different set of skills. And I think that's another form of collaborations to be encouraged going forward. Well, thank you so much for this really uh, inspiring and thoughtful Q&A and for your talk and for making these resources available. I look forward to seeing how um, I and members of uh, the community and our Duke community 
can use them. And uh, I'm just really grateful that you were able to be with us today. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Leslie Babinski to uh, wrap up. Thank you. And thank you, Anna, for moderating that discussion. We had so much interest in the Q&A and um, thank you for getting to many of those important questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Chetty, again, for a ter terrific presentation. Um, really was inspirational and the personalization of the data, I think really did touch many of us and the work that we do. Um, please remember participants to click on the link in the chat to give us feedback on today's event. And finally, I'm excited to announce that Dr. Cynthia Garcia Call, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Puerto Rico Medical School and Professor Merita at Brown University will address inequality, racism, and COVID-19 at our next Salzburger lecture on March 23rd. Be sure to join us for that presentation. Thank you again, Dr. Chetty. Good night, everyone. Thank you.